away, let me sort of say just a little bit about what I have in mind for today. I mean, Please. it's just a little bit of time. Um, and uh, uh, like, like, I, like, like I'm, a, I'm a behavior analyst and ACT is applied behavior analysis. And uh, uh, I know that some people, uh, uh, the, the last thing I did for uh, ABAI is I did a, uh, I did a SUDS, uh, substance use disorders, uh, talk for them in Washington, D.C. Okay. And I got some pretty distinctly different responses uh, uh, to that talk. So uh, interestingly enough, some of the, the uh, old farts were, uh, were uh, quite lovely and uh, praiseful. Uh, of, of the talk, even some that we used to fight, you know, at uh, <laughs> ABAI during the uh, during the old uh, uh, you know theory and philosophy wars, uh, you know, back in the '90s, you know, and so Jack Marr was, you know, uh, lovely and uh, praiseful, uh, and uh, but there were some people who were uh, pretty disturbed that I was there, you know, and uh, they said things like, you know. How dare they put this on the stage? You know, this is not behavior analysis. Uh, you know, it's outrageous, blah, 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 you know. And, uh, and then the, the third set, uh, which is the one that I care about the most, was that I was just like mobbed by, you know, I would say uh, between 22 and 35-year-old behavior analysts. Um, who were saying things to me like, why, and I think one actually asked from the audience, why isn't this in our curriculum? And yeah. I said, well, you should go home and uh, ask your faculty that question. <laughs> <laughs> you, you should devil them with that, with that uh, question. Um, and, and really, I've uh, had, I, I found that the people who are doing applied behavior analysis in kind of real world settings in classrooms and in, you know, precision teaching shops like fit learning um, or in schools or, you know, doing behavior therapy in homes and like that, that there's more to the world that they're trying to contend with than are well captured in, you know, discrete trial training or like that. And the things that they're having to contend with go way, um, are, are much broader, richer, and deeper than, um, you know, every, everything that is, uh, countable doesn't count and everything that counts isn't countable. Um, and I know that there are some behavior analysts that that just really pisses them off uh, <laughs> to hear that, but just because it, pisses some behavior analysts off doesn't make it not behavior analysis. Like, I'm sorry, that is not a qualifying feature of behavior analysis that, you know, it makes, you know, some subset of behavior analysts like happy because, you know, it fits into the experimental analysis of behavior, which is, is not now and never was exhaustive of the content of behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't. You know, and if you don't believe me, read Skinner, you know, read, you know, uh, uh, you know, one of his collections of essays, read Science and Human Behavior. And, uh, and it, it, it is clear. Uh, and, and really, if you want to get your mind blown in the way my mind was blown and the way that I like got interested in behavior analysis um, is read Willard Day. I mean, read Sam Legland's collections of the original papers of Willard Day read behaviorism and reconciliation with phenomenology. And this, this, this shit will blow your mind. Um, uh, you know, Willard Day was not, uh, what, you know, was as Skinnerian as they get. Um, uh, and uh, he recognized that Skinner's interests were much, much broader uh, than, you know, the operant chamber or some, um, you know, sort of parallel human version of the operant chamber. Um, uh, uh, when I, in uh, the 1980s, when I uh, uh, started working with Sam Legland uh, as an undergraduate, um, 
I was familiar with applied behavior analysis in its barest form because I worked at a place um, that served intellectually disabled uh, adults who had been institutionalized for their entire lives in one of these great big um, uh, institutions that, you know, used to be common, you know, through the, you know, like when I was growing up in the 1950s and 1960s, this is where people went um, who, uh, you know, showed, you know, just about any form of intellectual disability. Uh, The place that these people had come out of uh, had at one time had, you know, like a couple of thousand people living there. I mean, it was a human warehouse uh, that was built at a time when the best that science and medicine had to offer families was your child, you know, this child born with Down syndrome is going to tear your life apart and it's going to tear your family apart. And the best thing you can do for them is to put them in our hands and we'll take them to this institution, you know, uh, where they can live their lives out. And, uh, and, and it was just, just the deepest sort of wrong, you know, the deepest sort of wrong. And so I worked at a place where we served these folks who were trying to like figure out how to live in a world with choices or even what a choice was because they grew up eating at eating time and sleeping at going to sleep time. And, uh, you know, that, their life was exhausted by a schedule. Um, And, you know, the closest they got to a choice was, you know, maybe chocolate or vanilla at dessert. Um, So that was like the environment when I met Sam. What I couldn't put together then was, what did this stuff, how, how did this behavioral way of thinking, which was so powerful, and was moving these people with profound disabilities out into the community where they had like actual choices about, you know, what they ate and, you know, where they might go and things like that. Like what those contingencies had to do with people who um, were struggling with the kinds of things I was struggling with and the people who um, uh, were proximal to me you know, things like, am I going to stay alive, you know, and how can I do that? You know, uh, how can I live uh, in this world? And um, at that time, I kind of thought I had two psychologies. So I had behavior analysis that I could use to help people learn to ride the bus and stuff like that. And then I had Viktor Frankl, you know, and uh, and Viktor Frankl, you know, I saw Frankel, uh, you know, in a death camp, uh, finding liberation, or finding a sense of liberation in a death camp. And so I go into Sam Legland's class that first time, and uh, in uh, undergraduate learning, there were like 10 of us in this class. And Sam, he's stalking back and forth across the front of the room and turns himself into this like giant human question mark, you know, kind of looming over us. And he says, what is the subject matter of behavior analysis? You know, and he wasn't looking for us to answer, you know, he, he had an answer. (laughs) And he said, any and all of the activities of the integrated organism. So if if, if the organism could do it, that is our proper subject matter. That is our dependent variable. And I just thought, whoa, you know, and uh, I, I, at the time I was carrying a copy of Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning around like a like a compass, you know, in case I should lose my way. Because I thought, you know, if Viktor Frankl could find liberation in a death camp, that maybe Kelly could find liberation in Spokane, Washington, you know. (laughs) And uh, so I went to Sam's office after that, and I like laid my copy of Viktor Frankl on his desk, and I said, what about this, you know. Um, I told this story in Australia some, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and, and a woman asked me, she said, did he give you an answer? And I said, no, he, he gave me a job. <laughs> and I've been on the job ever since, you know, which is to say, he didn't really give me an answer, but the answer he gave me was, 
if behavior analysis can't speak to us about something so fundamental as how to find purpose and meaning in the midst of hardship, then, you know, it's not much of a psychology, you know? Yeah. He took, the, he took my question seriously. Uh, and then he started handing me papers by, you know, Willard Day and Steve Hayes. And, oh, my goodness, my whole <laughs> world. My whole world just was upended, you know. And when I, went, when I met Willard and started talking to him about the things I was interested in, oh, he was terribly interested. He met me when I was an undergraduate. He said, he said at ABBA, and I talked to him for about four or five hours in his hotel room. Like, like it was in the afternoon, it got dark. So by the time we finished talking, the room was like dark, you know, we're like looking at each other across the table. And I'm just feeling out like this, like, what if we had behavior analysis for this and that? And I mean, I was, you know, booming, you know, yeah. and, uh, and Willard was like, mm, you know, and he says, you, you need to go home and start writing immediately. You know, like, don't wait, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I mean... It was like life changing, you know. He was saying, we can have a behavior analysis about what you're interested in. So what I have for us here, let me see if I can get my darn slides to advance. Uh, I'm not gonna spend any time on this slide at all. Um, and I'm gonna spend just a little tiny bit on, of time on this slide. So in case you wanna find the opposite of liberation, you wanna find like how to get stuck, burned out, checked out, uh, uh, you know, dragging through life, then, you know, here's how to do that. It's a formula. Lose contact with the moment that you're inhabiting. You know, sp spend a lot of time in, you know, worried about future, ruminated about past. Narrow your view to that one perspective that solving the problem of you uh, is your number one problem that must be solved before you, like, do anything else and hold on tight to that story about who you are and what you are capable of. Um, avoid anything that is difficult or confusing or painful. Good luck with that. Uh, hold tight on to stories about judgment, evaluation, and uh, limitation about the world and about you. Forget what really matters. That, that has to come only after you solve those you know, central problems of like what's wrong with you and settle into patterns of inaction, uh, uh, fearful persistence. But you probably already know how to do that. So let me talk about this practice model. <clears throat> Sometimes when you see this model and you see these things and, you know, like acceptance and these, they seem like these kind of highly abstract um, uh, concepts. Um, and you know, people who are interested in measurement, I suppose, you know, they think of them as, you know, uh, uh, some kind of theoretical construct or another. Um, but th that business does not interest me uh, nearly so much as the behavioral patterns that are um, uh, described in the model. So I want to talk about the model as a set of practices. And so I would say these are all uh, proper uh, dependent variables for behavior analysts because they are all things that you can do, right? Now, uh, to, to those who have like criticized that they haven't seen an experimental analysis of these things, I would say, well, get to work. You know, I mean, do I have to do everything? Uh, uh, you know, and are some of them are going to be hard? Yes. But it's sort of like the guy, uh, you know, looking for his keys underneath the street light, you know, and the fella comes along and he says, what are you doing? And the guy says, I'm trying to find my keys. And, uh, and the fella asks him, well, did you, you lose them here? And he says, no, no, I lost them over in the bushes over there. He said, why are you looking under the street light? He said, well, the light's better here. You know, we, we got to like uh, let go of looking where the light's better um, and, and look where the keys are, are, uh, are lost. So to me, you know, like I'm interested in a psychology that is liberatory. I'm interested, uh, you know, in a psychology, you know, I saw you and Rachel's wonderful 
uh, interview with um, with um, Pat Fryman, and he talks about a psychology that's redemptive. Oh my goodness! Right. Oh, now that's a psychology that interests me because you know uh, I, you know, like Pat said in that video, he said I've done bad things, and so have you. And so have you. Oh, man, I watched that and I was just like. <laughs> I think one of his lines is I've done uh, some, not exactly this, some of the fact that like, I've done dirty uh, deeds with all the seven deadly sins or something Every like that. You know? <laughs> That's, right. That's yeah. right. And he says to that room full of people, and so have you. And I would say the same to the people listening to this, and so have you. And we need a way back. We need a way back. Right now, finding your way back into the middle of life. If we can't have a behavior analysis that is about that, well, fuck that. I mean, seriously, really, you know, like <laughs> that's some thin soup you're trying to sell there. And I think we can. Well, how do you do that? And 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 to some extent, these practices that I I want to just move over, and then I'll take some questions. In some sense, these are descriptive of the way back. Um, because I am somebody who's done uh, terrible, uh, terrible things. Um, I, I didn't start college till I was like 30. And before that, I was a serial felon. You know, I mean, I, I was, uh, you know, voted most likely to die with a syringe hanging out of his arm in some shitty gas station bathroom, you know. In some ways, you could think of these practices as descriptive of myself and other people who have contributed to the development of this work of behavioral patterns, you know, that, that were part of that process of finding our way back, you know, into uh, ab abundance. Right, it's the opposite of aversive control. You think of aversive control as having this kind of narrowing impact on patterns of behavior. I mean, that's what aversive control does: is it sort of squeezes behavior down, you know, into a narrow track, um, where behavior gets flexibility um, is uh, not just in the presence of strong positive reinforcement, but in the presence of a sort of abundance of reinforcement. Right? That's where you start to see that kind of rolling variability where there are different things that you could sort of choose from in there. We need a psychology of abundance. This is what a psychology of positive reinforcement uh, is about. This is what Murray Sidman was writing about in Coercion and its fallout. How can we help people move out of this kind of restricted, narrow little range of living and into a broader uh, broader and richer world. Well, the first thing is that you can't live in this world unless you're in this world. And all of us know in a very common sense way that we can lose the moments that we inhabit. Um, sometimes we don't know until we lose something. You know, we lose something and then it reminds us like, oh goodness. Um, like I buried three brothers. I buried three of my brothers. I'm the only one left. Um, and uh, my sister's husband also. So my brother-in-law, four brothers I've buried. Um, I wrote a poem for a class I'm taking last week um, about uh, my brother Randy and about my last week that I was with him. And the last week that I saw him alive was Christmas of 1986. And um, I was so up in my head about how wrong he was living his life and how much I knew about what he should do and what I had done before and what I was doing then that um, I hardly spoke to him that week. I hardly spoke to him and he went home. 
And the next thing that I heard from or about him uh, was in April, um, the day after he'd taken his own life. You know, and so I would ask, you know, are you a brother? Are you a sister? You know, are your siblings alive right now? Do you love them? Do they know that? Because I don't know if my brother knew. I don't know if he knew that, you know, on his last day. This moment, right here, right now. You know, me, here with you, like real people in our lives, this life. We get lost in our head and this practice of coming back to the moment is coming back to noticing, you know, here I am and what is before me in this moment. Not like, how's this going to go? Or how did this go before? But right now, right now what's available. That's a practice. You know what it is to get lost. You know what it is to come back. To make a deliberate practice of that is what this part of the, the model is about. If you want sensitivity to contingencies, you have to be present to the contingencies that are before you. This acceptance one, like I, I almost never use the word acceptance, certainly not with clients, because it sounds like a, such a crazy, crazy idea. You know, somebody's like, have you ever had a panic attack? You know, what? like, you know, you start talking about acceptance and they start looking at you like you are an insane person. Um, but if you take it as a matter of practical pattern, almost everyone can understand the idea of practicing an open heart. You know, everybody's been hurt. You've been hurt. People have hurt you. And your natural inclination when you're hurt is to sort of, you know, gun up, you know, build a wall, close up, don't extend yourself. You know, when opportunities to connect with people come along, you know, you sort of push them to one side just a little bit. You postpone them a little bit. You slow them down a little bit, you know. To live and to love necessitates an open heart. Um, uh, uh, I read somewhere, heard somewhere someone say that having children is like having your heart on the outside of your body. And if you have children, um, you will know that that is a true thing. Like there is no pain available, like the pain that uh, comes available to you uh, the day you have your own child. Um, The poet John Erskine says, I keep the thorn to keep the rose. So that sort of willingness uh, to live with an open heart, um, knowing, in fact, being guaranteed that you will be hurt. You know, I talk to people, I say, I know you're afraid you'll be hurt. You know, and then they're expecting me to say, but I promise you, but, but I, and I do promise them, I say, yes, you're right. Um, and if you close your heart, you'll also be hurt. And so the only thing you have a choice about is, will what you're hurt, will the hurt be worth it? You know, will you have been doing something that to be hurt in that process is worthwhile? Um, let me skip down to the other, the, the bottom on that left side of the hexagon. Uh, with the uh, unfortunate name diffusion, which I also never use with clients. Not that I don't like these terms, but they're not client friendly. You know, you spend an hour explaining diffusion, that's an hour of your life that you'll never get back, you know. Practice, what, what the practice involves is a practice holding lightly judgments, evalu evaluations, and limitations. It doesn't mean you have to change your mind. It doesn't mean you have to be convinced otherwise. It doesn't mean that you're wrong. It just means that sometimes our judgments and evaluations uh, narrow our view in such a way that there are other things available um, that we're not seeing, right? Um, just like if I reached out and pinched you, you know, that particular little bit of your flesh would gather all your attention up. And there might be all kinds of other things going on uh, that are outside of that range. 
judgments and evaluations can be like that. You know, I mentioned my brother Randy in that last week I saw him alive. My judgments about how he was living his life were entirely accurate. I mean, they weren't inaccurate. He was living carelessly and foolishly and callously. Um, but you know what else was there that week? It was a chance uh, to be a brother. And if I had it to do over again, I'd be his brother that week. Even if it didn't change anything by outcome. He needed a brother that week more than he needed a judge. See, you see the, see the issue? It's not that I was wrong. It's not that I was incorrect. Well, I would say, it's not that I was incorrect. I was quite wrong, I would say. I, I, it's a hard lesson to learn that you can be correct and wrong at the same time. See, I had the facts right. I was correct in the facts, but I was wrong in the relationship. And the relationship was so much more important. See? Now, now think about your own kind of judgments, and especially the ones that make you the most pissed off, you know. Uh, and just consider for a moment that, you know, maybe there's more there that you're not seeing. And the more pissed off you are, the more likely it is that you won't see. Right? Now, I don't know how to be not pissed off, but I do know how to, you know, I, I can remember my brother Randy. I can remember the times when my judgments held me hostage and caused me to miss things that matter in my own life. And when I remember that, then it, it, it gentles me just a little bit. And you get like I'm not, I mean, I'm kind of a crazy person, you know, and I've already said fuck probably more than once in this, you know, so, you know, I'm a hothead also. So, you know. But I don't know that these are incompatible. It just means that some people need more practice than others, and I'm one of them. Um, let me move over to the right side, and then we'll take some questions. The practice on that right side is a, a practice at um, um, now, sometimes people talk about values work in terms of values clarification. I don't really like that language very much. Um, and if you look at the 2011 version of the ACT book, I went through and stripped out everywhere where it said values clarification in that book. And the reason I don't like values clarification is because it presumes that values are like these kind of fixed things that are there to be like clarified or uncovered or discovered or something like that. Um, and I, I don't think of them uh, or I don't think, I don't find it useful to think of them as pre-existing things uh, because then people, it lends to itself to conversations about like, you know, are these my real values? Is my true, do I really value this? Or, you know, are these my true values? And I have no idea how to answer those questions. So I like to think about it as like values construction. So in this regard, you sort of like, you think of it as building a kind of a, a house, you know? And so like, I'm a father, for example, and I've kind of built a, a pattern that I live inside of as a father. And, you know, if I built like a house, you know, metaphorical, like my sort of being a dad house, I could take you on a tour and say, you know, here are the different parts of my being a dad house, you know, and, and, uh, you know, you might ask me, do you like all of this house or, you know, and I might say, well, you know, this parts I like pretty well, this part, you know, uh, it doesn't seem like that good of an idea, but I would never say, you'd never say, but is this my true house? No, it's the house you built, you know, and you can kind of look through your life in that regard. You know, are you a brother? Are you a sister? Are you a friend? Are you a member of the community? You know, are you the child of, uh, you know, living parents? And, and, and what is the shape of your lived um, pattern and the cultivation of that and the sort of, imagining the shape that that could take over time. Um, 
and it's an uh, you know the other thing about it as as a construction project is that it's an evolving pattern so for example my wife and i have been in november we'll be together 41 years that's quite a good long bit of time isn't it and uh and i'm a devoted husband and what it meant to be a devoted husband like what's the pattern well the pattern when i was you know 25 is not the same uh, a pattern as I inhabited, um, you know, in 1998 when I was diagnosed with cancer. And it's not the same pattern as in 2007 when my wife was diagnosed with cancer. Um, the father, the, the husband she needed when we had no children was not the same husband she needed when we had small children. This is not the same husband that she needs, you know, now in our lives with our children all grown. And, and gone. So it's this ongoing conversation uh, with life about the kind of shape of the things that matter and how I inhabit them in my life. The last process, uh, and I'll uh, stop and take some uh, questions, uh, is um, commitment. Um, perhaps the most uh, easily, you know, one of the most easily misunderstood processes uh, in ACT because people think about commitment and they think about the future. So, you know, commitment's about, I promise to do, you know, X, Y, Z later. So commitment in ACT has nothing to do with the future, nothing at all to do with the future. Um, commitment has to do with those patterns I was talking about. And that if you're sort of living along a certain pattern, not if, but when you find yourself off the pattern, which you will, you know, if you're like a mom or a brother or a friend, you will find yourself at certain moments in your life where you notice, I am not the friend that I want to be. You know, I am not the brother that I want to be. And then there's that moment of recognition, and then there's the return to the pattern. What would a brother who had behaved out of that pattern do in the moment that he found himself out of the pattern. Like, what would that return look like? And then to put myself into that return. See, uh, you know, when Pat talked about uh, a psychology about redemption, see, see, I can't go back to Christmas of 1986, but I can recognize I can recognize that I fell out of the pattern. And I could think all these years later, what would a what would a brother, what brother would I be? And it is this one, you know, one that acknowledges um, a terrible wrong. Um, and hopes that the people listening to this, who might listen to this, would hear that and would look at their own pattern. See, this is how we honor our losses. This is how we find our way back, you know, into the middle of living. Not painful or not painless, but uh, worth it. And with that, I'll, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen, if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> And there you are, you lovely human beings. <laughs>